months. They don't want to worry about parking. Uh, we think that would be the first customer. So commercialization is on the horizon in Las Vegas and also San Francisco. That would be next. How do you stay motivated on that road to commercialization, given that there are still, as you say, these hard problems to solve? Because every day, literally, either something happens in terms of progress. And it's really important to not just look at the ultimate success, but I call it like kind of along the way, the little celebration. I mean, even when I do drive review, yes, I have a long list or, you know, oh, what about this? What about that? But the vehicle will do something new or something awesome. And you're like, oh, my gosh, you go. Awesome. So there are so many things that happen on a daily basis, weekly basis that you see advancement. I, I talk. It's like climbing, right? It's like you get to a certain element or a certain place, you appreciate the journey, you turn around, you look down, you see what you've done, then you're like, all right, let's go for the next peak. So as you put points on the board, mm -hmm. what does I I see, I want, and I hope to lay the foundation for a global mobility giant. We talked about human being need transportation, everywhere. It opens up access to economic mobility. It opens up access to knowledge. It opens up access to inclusion, uh, not to mention safety, the environment. And frankly, humans, we're just too valuable to spend also 400 billion hours worldwide driving. And we think that this is at the center of that puzzle. So that is the goal. All right. So we're going to do, this is a little rapid fire yes. section now. Um, so just quick answers. Um, what does Zooks stand for? The word Zooks is uh, basically a marine um, uh, sort of species that is solar powered and uh, self-moving in the ocean. Interesting. Best piece of advice for your 20s? Take a chill pill. It'll be OK. <laughs> what about your 40s? Enjoy the journey, you've made it. <laughs> um, I hear you owned a restaurant at some point, is that true? I confuse the love of cooking and running a restaurant. <laughs> What's your favorite thing to cook? Uh, Chebujan, which is a Senegalese dish. Biggest guilty pleasure? <laughs> Trashy books. <laughs> Ooh, what books? <laughs> I'm not telling. <laughs> um, speaking of fellow travelers, what's your favorite travel destination? Hawaii. Me too. Which island? Kauai. Mm. I'm from Hawaii. Kauai all the way. Last TV show you binged? Uh, I'm in the middle of it. Uh, Bridgeton. Ooh. <laughs> What's your view on work-life integration? I don't use the word balance. Work-life choices, setting expectations on all sides. How do your kids fit into your life? They are everything. They are the beginning and the end. Our driverless future is always right around the corner or 10 years away. Give us a realistic timeline. When can we ride in Azooks? A lot of people ask me, when can I tell my kids they can't have a, they shouldn't get a driver's license? And I think it's going to be probably my kids' kids. Arguments for and against going public? Against, uh, definitely focus. Um, the quarterly pressure is something I understand and know. And uh, this is a long-term journey, so focus is important. Four, it seems to be everybody's dream in this valley. <laughs> is it yours? Is no, that the plan? No, my, my, my dream is to... I don't know, we'll have to see. What about Tiger Zooks in 10 years? Several cities. And um, there I say, hey, I'm going to Zooks my way over there. Aisha Evans, CEO of Zooks, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you. My pleasure. I appreciate you coming over.
No one covers the world like Bloomberg. You have to show action on behalf of the American people, and that's exactly what the president is doing. The major fault line at this early stage is tax. For the oil market, this is a big moment to see it. The kingdom is willing to step in. With unmatched reach and resources. Global Business Authority. Companies now, they're getting hundreds, maybe even thousands of applications. So software has come in to automate the process. You want to write your resume for robots, not for humans. The only job your resume has is to be comprehensible to the segment of the population that might not be totally inclusive or not be a full, fully aware concerns about how this technology could ex exacerbate discrimination for the FTC I think foremost the FTC needs to be making sure that we're fully understanding this technology we don't trust companies to self regulate when it comes to pollution we don't I've been an investor. The highest calling of mankind, I've often thought, was private equity. <laughs> and then I started interviewing. And while I watch your interview, because I know how to do some interviews. <laughs> I've learned in doing my interviews how leaders make it to the top. I asked him how much he wanted. He said 250. I said fine. I didn't negotiate with him. I did no due diligence. Told I have me. something I'd like to sell. <laughs> and how they stay there. You don't feel inadequate now because being only the second wealthiest man in the world. Is that right? <laughs> In January of 2013, Phoebe Novakovic became the CEO of General Dynamics, one of the nation's largest aerospace defense contractors. Since that time, its stock is up by more than 180%. I had a chance to sit down with Phoebe Novakovic in Sterling Heights, Michigan, and saw there the Abrams tanks that are manufactured by General Dynamics and talked to her about the future of the aerospace defense industry. When you became the CEO of General Dynamics in 2013, uh, there weren't that many women who were aerospace defense executives. Uh, did you ever think when you were joining this company in 2001 that you could rise up to be uh, the CEO? I never thought I'd be the CEO. I think that would be highly aspirational. Um, and I, uh, I've always been a big believer in, in you do well in life by doing the job in front of you very, very well, being part of a team and serving that team. But I never could have believed that this would happen. So do you get tired when people like me ask you what it's like to be a woman and being the CEO of an aerospace defense company? Or you get asked that a lot? Um, I think some. I think um, I, and you and I have talked about this before, I approach this job primarily as a person, largely one form by being a woman, um, but not exclusively. So I think about myself as a person and, and in this position, not so much a woman. Uh, your stock is up 180% since you became the CEO. Uh, do you think under President Biden, defense spending may level off and therefore it may be harder for aerospace defense companies to do as well? So I think defense spending historically has been driven by the threat or the perception of threat. But, um, and it is not a particularly safe world at the moment. That's number one. Number two, President Biden has been a lifelong supporter of national security. So this uh, budget that he submitted to Capitol Hill was a nominal increase. 
Um, importantly, all of our programs were fully supported because of their criticality to the war fight. Most of the large aerospace defense companies have moved to Washington. Do you see the Pentagon leaders from time to time? Do you go see the secretaries of Army or, or Air Force or, defense, or, or Navy? Or what do you do in terms of interacting with them? So I think it's important that um, both on the uniform military side, and we tend to try to know them as well. Um, and then with each change of administration, we try to get to know the primary decision makers so we can get inside their decision space, help them think about vibe. So I spend some time with, with all of them and our major customers. So that would be primarily the Army and the uh, Navy. The American people obviously have a high regard for our military but they don't tend to think of the defense contractors as highly as they do of the military. So do you think there's any reason for that? So I don't know that they're particularly not beloved, but this is the way I think about it. Um, if the U.S. cannot avoid war through diplomacy or deterrence, um, it goes to war. what the issues will be moving forward as this industry goes. Yeah, well, you, you don't know, of course. That's the risk that you take. There is no uh, risk-free reward in investing, and there's certainly a lot of risks in the crypto market. But if you look at what took place over the last cycle, we saw the rapid emergence of DeFi, we saw the rapid emergence of NFTs, dollars plus flow into stable coins, all built on programmable blockchains like Ethereum. As we get through this crypto window and start thinking about what are the new products that we're going to see in the future? We're going to see growth in DeFi, in NFTs and stable coins. We'll also see huge growth in things like Web3 interactions, uh, gaming, digital identity. I think the, the market cycle, the next market cycle we're moving to is going to be orders of magnitude larger than the last cycle. And that was really okay. just a proof of concept phase. This next few years is when crypto goes mainstream. So that's what we expect from Ethereum and the broader crypto industry. So tease that out for me a bit. How, how much bigger do you think the cycle will be? Oh, I think it's, I think it's you know, mul many multiple times bigger is the answer to that. Again, we saw, if you think about crypto's returns, what drives crypto's returns? Crypto booms when it develops products that people want. It boomed in the early 2010s when people developed Bitcoin, which was this interesting non-monetary asset, non-sovereign monetary asset. It boomed in 2016, 2017, when we had Ethereum and ICOs. The most recent boom was when we had NFTs and we had stable coins uh, and, and we had DeFi, but that just penetrated 1% of the market. I think the market opportunity for all of those are 10X. I think there are five or six other killer products that we'll see in the next market cycle. So I really think that the next boom could be five, 10 times bigger than the prior boom. I think it will be the moment that crypto goes mainstream and your friends, your uncles, your cousins are all interacting with the crypto market, be it through gaming, digital identity, music NFTs, ticketing, DeFi for payments. I do think it is orders of magnitude larger. It's probably still a year or two off, uh, but you can see it clearly on the horizon and we're getting closer to it every day. your take on what's going on in the crypto markets right now obviously we've seen a lot of red we're seeing 
a bit of a turnaround now. Nobody knows if this is a, a long-term sustainable rally or if this is just a blip. Um, I know it's hot where you are, but it's certainly feeling cold if you're an investor. What's your take? Well, first, thank you for having me. And you're right, it is hot where uh, I am. It's about 102 <laughs> degrees here in Austin, Texas. Uh, and of course, that heat wave is running across the, the entire South. Um, what what I, I think I would say we really are seeing is, uh, first of all, uh, a, a period in our industry that happens with many growing and nascent industries where in fact rationalization and some cleansing occurs. And uh, when you take market pressure, macroeconomic pressure, pressure on technology, and the pressure in our industries, what you're seeing is a tumultuous period of time. Volley referenced it, we've seen Bitcoin come back a bit, and we're very happy to see some stability in the pricing of digital assets. Now, we've seen Bitcoin mining companies, which, you know, they're normally big holders, uh, selling their assets. You just dumped a, a huge portion of your Bitcoin a month ago. Why? And do you wish well, you didn't at this point? <laughs> uh, no, I, 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 I can't say that I regret what we have done. Um, but we produce a lot of Bitcoin every month. We're currently running at a pace of 1,200 bit considerably over the course of this year as we continue to invest in both our uh, servers and our infrastructure. There are a couple of uh, considerations that are axiomatic when you're running a, you have to make sure you've got enough to, and we produce Bitcoin, but our, our obligations are in dollars. So we need to make sure we generate enough dollars to pay those obligations. Second is in these distressed or tumultuous environments, uh, liquidity is very important. Uh, if you've got liquidity, one, you both make sure that your business is built to survive and cities that arise in a distressed marketplace become much more liquid on our bank, give us a lot more flexibility. Impact operations of any risk policies here, really, and any risk management. Did they sort of state that, that in hindsight, there needed to be more protections in place? Yes, in hindsight, uh, that's the key the word here. Thing, yeah. <laughs> yes, they've been, they, they've been doing so well for such a long time that they, they fully believed in their strategy. And that's what caused the problem eventually. And there's a lack of risk management, as you said. Yue Chiang, thank you so much for your time. We're going to move now to our second take because we're going to focus on the crypto collapse and the blow to investor trust that's being felt across the space. It's a topic that was addressed by Mike Novogratz, founder and CEO of Galaxy Digital Holdings. He spoke with me earlier this week at the Crypto Summit for Bloomberg. Take a listen. What I don't think people expected was the magnitude of losses that would show up in, you know, professional institutions' balance sheets. And that caused a daisy chain of effects. It turned into a full-fledged credit crisis, right, with complete liquidation uh, and huge damage to confidence in the space, into the infrastructure of the space. We're going to talk about that crisis of confidence now with Mike Alfred, founding member, founding board member of Eagle Brook Advisors. Mike. You know, in the way that the liquidation process is working out, what are some of the biggest issues that you see sorting itself out as we look at really a landmark moment for the entire crypto industry? Yeah, it's an unfortunate uh, situation. I never actually met Kyle or Sue personally, but I interacted with them a bit on, on Twitter and they came across as, you know, some of the smartest guys in the whole space. They're very widely respected. And I think that's why people gave them a lot of latitude, right? If it had been anyone else, these lending firms, these trading firms might have imposed uh, a bit more rigor and diligence on, uh, you know, supplying them with more capital. You saw in the affidavit that several of the firms declined to do business with them at the end um, because they wouldn't provide an audited financial statement. And I think that's a key point here is that the free market should dictate that there should be a kind of wind down in some of this excess leverage, right? There was too much leverage in the system. Mm -hmm. Pretty much everybody deep in the space knew there was too much leverage in the system, but the reality is everybody was making so much money that there was no sort of discipline around that process. I think this incident and the broader contagion that it sort of spurred will rein that in on its own, and we don't really need necessarily more regulation for that to happen. I think it's already happening right now. And many would say, look, this happens in... TradFi as well. You think of Bill Huang, we think of the leverage that was across the system there. And, and that was in and among regulated institutions. And, and uh, of course, 
companies that we know well and thought were perhaps the, the, the lack of transparency is something that we know in TradFi, not just in, of course, DeFi and, and crypto as well. I'm interested, though, as to what you make of how we will get through the process of those that are owed money and and what's been seen has been questionable. We know that the three arrows founders have said, look, they themselves think that they that they're being accused of absconding funds during the last period and they're saying that is not true what did you make of the creditor list and and what sort of picture it painted so i mean obviously there's a lot of folks on that list because this is a very interconnected and incestuous space a lot of these firms do business with each other in multiple contexts um, you know genesis is one of the largest lenders uh, in the entire ecosystem so it's no surprise that they showed up you know at the top of the list uh, Digital Currency Group, the parent company of Genesis, is a very well-capitalized business. They own seven different subsidiaries. They they basically print money in crypto. I'm not really worried about them. I'm actually a lot more worried about the folks that were exposed to Celsius because Celsius held a sort of retail-oriented mm. shadow bank. It was this beautiful-looking fintech that you just deposit your money in and you get your rewards every Monday. Uh, Three Arrows never held themselves out to retail like that. They never held themselves out to be a bank. Uh, it was very clear that they were a risky firm to do business with, in my in my view. And so the firms that are creditors to Three Arrows, I think, are uh, you know a little bit more sophisticated on average than the firm than the individuals that'll be uh, creditors of some of these other uh, firms through the bankruptcy process. And so that gives me a little bit of hope because I think most of the firms at the top of the list uh, for Three Arrows can mostly take care of themselves. Like they'll be fine even if they don't uh, recover that much from the situation. But Mike, how do you reinstate confidence after something like this? I mean, we've talked about how some of there's so much leverage in the system. How do you dive back in when this could very easily happen again? I don't think you try in the sense that uh, in traditional markets, the Federal Reserve would do that job for us, right? Or Treasury, they would jump in and just save entire industries or entire companies like in the financial crisis. The thing that gives people confidence in the broader crypto and Bitcoin space is that there isn't really a requirement that the government step in at all. In fact, in a lot of ways, in a few months from now, maybe even just three to six months, uh, the market will mostly be back to normal and people will be doing what they do uh, in this space. And so I think the fact that if there is a bailout, it's from a private actor like SBF at FTX, mm -hmm. who came in and basically bailed out BlockFi. Another firm, by the way, that was just as irresponsible in my view as Celsius, but maintain investor trust uh, throughout the whole process. Um, you know, the, he can do that if he wants. It's a free market. Um, but we don't require government intervention you know, uh, in the crypto market. Well, that's what I'm wondering also. I remember prior to this, all of last year, when things were really good, I kept on asking people, why are you comfortable uh, engaging with a crypto lender when, unlike a normal bank, you're not dealing with an FDIC insured? And so to the point that you're making, what does all of this mean for the retail investor who was borrowing uh, in this industry? Where does it go from here? Look, there's no free money, there's no free lunch, there's no free yield. Uh, if you were trading call options on tech stocks, on Robinhood, you probably got blown up too, right? And so crypto is not the, crypto is not the only space where this type of stuff is happening. Um, it comes down to investor education, right, and financial literacy. And if you're not educated on how to invest broadly, crypto is not going to be any safer or any riskier uh, for you than anywhere else. But I would say going forward, if something looks too good to be true, it usually is. So someone offers you a yield that's 10 uh, whole percentage points more than what you can get at a bank, there's a good chance that the markets and people should not be deluded about that fact. Well said, Mike. Thank you so much. Moving us to your lever team, Mike Alfred. Moving us to your lever team, Mike Alfred found board member of Eagle Brook Advisors. Coming up, well, amid the fallout, one argument, I can't have actually level of leverage. We're going to talk about all of this with Jill Gunter, who's co-founder.